And so what I would like to do is, is have each of the panelists give a, a quick one minute introduction and so we, we know who we're dealing with up here. So if you could start, Bert. Okay, I'll try to speak up. I'm Bert Vermeulen from uh, Colorado State University. I'm Brian Propp. Uh, I run a factory in um, Fort Collins that makes structural insulated panels, uh, energy efficient building materials. <clears throat> But in the past, I was chairman of RTD, Regional Transportation District, Mass Transit System in uh, five counties of Colorado. <clears throat> and I worked overseas in Kiev, Ukraine, and all over the former Soviet Union. Um, lived in Washington, D.C. for several years, so I spent a lot of time on mass transit and, uh, and working in mass transit. I also uh, spent a lot of time in <clears throat> the field of logistics. So that's why I'm here. Uh, Jack Panter. I'm a retired airline pilot, but I started as a Navy fighter pilot, and uh, I was an instructor on 747s for the last 15 years, but we dealt with a lot of safety issues, safety problems, accidents, uh, traveled over probably 50% of the world, dealing with a lot of uh, interesting things like crossing borders, if you land in the wrong airport, you better make sure it's not the wrong nation. There's a difference. I live in Glenwood Springs, and I drove down here just to talk to Daryl today. All right, very good. Let's, let's start off with a, a quick question here. Obviously, when you're listening to the overview, there's a, there's a big difference between where we're at today and the picture that Daryl painted. Uh, several years out in the future. Um, if, if we could start with you, Burgess, what what's the kind of the next step in your mind, and what are the biggest problems that were uh, kind of challenges that are we have to overcome to, to get to that next step? Well, I think one of the best ways to look at this is it's a scale-up problem, and and we were already talking about it earlier. Like, what's the longest? Um, demonstration project that currently exists because if you can understand where things are then you can work out okay what's the next level that we need to get to can we double that length can we um, improve it in these other ways double the speed things of that nature so so when we think about 4,000 uh, miles per hour and we think about 14,000 miles that's a huge step but if we can break it down into much smaller ones and know where we are now that's the way to really work out where it's all gonna go but let me point out one other thing that I think is kind of interesting, and that is one of your first patents was in 1999. And we're now 12 years later, and patents don't only last about 17 years. So one of the challenges here is in terms of intellectual property and owning that intellectual property is it will probably expire before you can actually implement it. Okay. Uh, same question. What do you see as the uh, big challenges ahead and the next steps that we have to take? I think the biggest challenge is trying to get the existing um, mental infra infrastructure um, of mass transit changed. Um, right now we've, we hear that President Obama is hell-bent on high-speed rail. Well, look at the mass transit systems that exist today uh, within cities. Um, known as light rail. Only 2% of the population of uh, Denver metro area use um, RTD. And about 0.2% uses light rail. But we all pay for it. But only 2% actually use it. Why don't they use it? Well, it doesn't go where they want to go when they want to go there. Uh, they like being in their vehicle so that they can uh, make their own decisions, go their own places, be free, be independent. I used, when I lived in Washington, D.C. for four years, I didn't own a vehicle. And believe me, if you live in D.C., you don't want to own a vehicle. Now, the cost of ownership is extremely high. Uh, parking is extremely high. Vandalism occurs all over every day. And so I rode the, the, you know, the metro system every day. 
I rarely use the bus system, but I use the metro system a lot, and I put a lot of miles on my legs. But it was great. But that's um, a population density and a, and a culture that is far different than what we have anywhere in the western half of the United States. There's only a few places in the United States that have that situation. Washington, D.C., Chicago, L.A., that's about it. Uh, I lived in Moscow. I lived in Ukraine. Moscow, 8 million people. And um, when I lived there, virtually nobody owned a car because they couldn't afford to and there was no credit. Then when I moved to Ukraine, in Kiev, they were just starting to recover economically. And people were buying cars. Well, there weren't enough roadways. So Denver was putting in light rail, basically taking up highway right away to put in light rail. At the same time, Kiev was taking out light rail and adding lanes of traffic. Why? Because a light rail train only goes by about once every four minutes and maybe has 50 passengers max. But two lanes of traffic or three lanes of traffic that you can put in the same area can carry that same amount of people in buses and possibly propane-powered buses or electric buses, but that those lanes of traffic are now open for everybody. And so they were able to achieve much more uh, traffic flow by getting rid of light rail and adding two or three lanes of traffic to those streets. At the same time, Denver was taking up right away and putting in light rail. So that whole political and mental infrastructure that exists around high-speed rail, commuter rail, light rail has to go away. It's not cost-effective. It doesn't create the traffic flow that we need. There has to be a change in mentality, and that's the biggest challenge. Uh, one of the things I work on all the time is escaping the paradigm of what transportation ought to be. Um, my best example, you folks may even know this, but in 1958, 80% of the watch market was controlled by five Swiss villages. You got the 1621 jewel ruby bearing watches. And a Swiss watchmaker invented an electric watch. And he went to those five villages and he said, hey, look what I've invented. They didn't even think it was significant enough to buy up his patent. And uh, uh, so he went to Japan. They did see the value of it. 1968, Japan held 80% of the world's watch market. Now these Swiss watch makers, they're not dumb people. So we can't say, gee, you were real dumb. That wouldn't fit. But that watch was outside of their view of what a watch ought to be. And they couldn't see it. Um, that is one of the problems that we have that you mentioned. And so I spend a lot of time um, trying to prove that this innovation will work and our present project with Daryl is to build a capsule that people can sit in and feel. Um, a lot of people think, oh, I don't want to be confined in a tube. I don't, know, I don't have a better word for tube. I wish I had one to get outside of that fear of being in a tube. But this capsule is the same as the inside of a Toyota Corolla. I want to have a capsule that when I stop and talk to the political people in charge of right away, they can say, oh yeah, maybe this isn't as bad as I thought. That's what we're working on. You just heard some, some of the problems, and what do you see as kind of the, the big challenges, the next steps uh, to break free of the existing paradigms? 
<laughs> one, of the, uh, one of the issues that was brought up I'd like to address, which is the IP um, issue. The, the, uh, um, the intellectual property now has grown to um, include other licensees' intellectual property. For instance, the um, magnetic levitation technology of the Chinese that you saw. And um, the terms of the license agreement allow licensees to make improvements to technology. So that is growing faster than the terms of those patents are expiring. So the license gains value with time instead of losing value with time like the typical intellectual property um, license. And also we're making it cheaper to um, join the consortium instead of trying to uh, go it alone. So we see the intellectual property value as only a small percentage of the value of the license that allows that, uh, that team effort and that collaboration. The, uh, so that, that's part of the paradigm to, uh, to get around is the existing models and, and the traditional models. If we look at the, what we think business is and you know, the business 1.0 um, philosophy that Henry Ford had to go through of, of uh, raising the capital to build the factories to build everything, that model doesn't work anywhere anymore. Um, the, the business 2.0 strategy and maybe 2.5 now with uh, companies like Google totally turning advertising upside down and newspapers going broke because they're not adopting to the new technologies and the new times. So part of the issue is, is disruption and that initial curve, logarithmic curve of, of disruption, the first 10, 20 years, it doesn't look like anything's happening. Everything's underground. It doesn't look like it. When you plant the seeds in the ground, it doesn't look like anything's happening until it emerges and you see the evidence of life there. But all that important stuff is, is happening underground before it emerges, and, and it, takes, it takes a lot of time. So at one point, the railroads in the United States, eventually they're building from the West Coast, and they're building from the East Coast, and they, they came together at this big ceremony, and I think it was in Utah, they, uh, they put a spike in the railroad, and, and it connected the entire country then, the West Coast and the East Coast. How long before you actually see a tube that connects the West and East Coast of the United States, uh, realistically? We believe once this starts, once we get those first systems proven and the practical applications, that since we already have the production capacity to, to build all this all over the world, we're going to see this displacement occur much, much quicker because compared to Henry Ford's time, people are a lot less resistant to change now than they were back in Ford's time. So when we see advantages, we see something advertised on TV, which didn't exist in Ford's time, and we whip out our credit card, which didn't exist in Ford's time. We open up our cell phone and dial the number and order it. In Henry Ford's time, the, the guy that ordered the first cars, he was crazy. The, the guys that had been for the last 500 years using animal-powered transportation, uh, they, they said, uh, you know, look at, the, they laughed at him until they started realizing that their neighbor was getting a little bit more work done per day. When he got home, he didn't have to uh, take care of the animals and uh, um, feed him. He was then playing with his kids and enjoying supper. So um, th th those paradigms are changing at an accelerating rate. Those S curves of adoption um, from displacing uh, um, past modes uh, much, much quicker um, now than it was back when the Industrial Revolution was starting. So we think getting that first domino, figuring out which which is that first domino that we can push over that makes all the rest of them um, tumble down. I'm going to add a little bit more in terms of technical challenges and, and let you kind of comment on some of these as well. Um, the, what we're talking about here is a tube. Let's just call it a tube. And the analogy is similar to pipelines. And one of the great challenges with pipelines, I don't know how many of you have, have ever been to the Alaska pipeline or seen a large diameter pipeline. One of the big challenges is thermal expansion and contraction. And it's somewhere, I don't know the exact number, but it's somewhere between five foot per mile and 50 feet per mile that it expands and contracts during normal changes in temperature. 
So one of the challenges I'd like to have you comment on how these tubes actually handle that thermal expansion and contraction. Um, a second area that is worth understanding is um, keeping it all sealed. So again, if we think about the Alaska pipeline, it's dealing with a fluid that is relatively viscous. So the amount of leakage is, is going to be less than what you're trying to seal is air. And at one point um, in Russia, this is back in around 1991 when the um, Soviet system came apart, one of the things that I heard is that about 50% of the oil in their pipelines running from Siberia actually got lost along the way. So clearly maintaining a vacuum is, um, is, is going to be a real challenge in that, in, that kind of, in that tube and then making sure that that's always there. There's another interesting problem, which is you're having people inside of a capsule that is in a vacuum. It might as well be space in, in some ways. So the air that is in that capsule is the air they're going to be breathing, and there's no opportunity to exchange that air with outside air. So there has to be, for five, 10 minutes, that's OK. But for longer time periods, it's kind of like a spacecraft. So it, it would need some of those same kinds of things. Uh, we mentioned a little bit about the radius of curvature issue. In fact, you have very good material on the radius of curvature issue. Um, this has been the real problem with rail transportation to date, because um, <clears throat> you have to get the right-of-way that is straight enough, and you have to build the bridges and tunnels so that the uh, vertical curvature is, is also um, clearly managed. And um, that's not a problem if you're around highway speeds, because you can build it around an interstate highway. But if you get too many times faster than the speed on the interstate, you can imagine then it gets much harder to be able to use that same right-of-way because what you need is something that is far more level and far straighter. And one of the best pictures, I don't know how many of you have ever seen this, but if you take the Autobahn between, I think it's Cologne and Frankfurt, they have the railway running next to it, the high-speed ICE train. And it basically, it runs in the same area, but it basically goes out of one hill, um, across a bridge, and into the next hill, because it's got to be that straight. So those are some of the, I think, the real major challenges from a technical standpoint that are worth identifying as well. All right, can you comment on that, Daryl? Yeah, certainly. Um, the, uh, what we agree that there's a lot of analogies with the uh, pipelines, and uh, we've studied the Alaska pipeline. Um, some of the other issues that you didn't bring up are the, uh, the issues of seismic uh, disturbances. Um, the Alaska Pipeline crosses um, the Denali Fault, and in uh, 2002, there was a major 5.9 magnitude earthquake where that fault line shifted 5.5 meters on one side of the fault line relative to the other side in a distance of about 200 meters. And they had identified that and mitigated it, and there wasn't a single leakage in that pipe. Um, we like the analogy of pipes because pipelines move uh, presently about uh, um, 20 to 30 percent of the ton miles of freight that move in the United States, and it is the single most productive industry in the United States on a per employee level. Um, $1.5 million of productivity per person working in um, pipeline transportation. So um, a lot of those aspects are, are proven. It's, it's so um, low loss compared to rail transportation. Rail transportation is very low loss. If you consider the safety of rail, it's about 10 times the relative safety of flying an airplane. Um, flying an airplane is about 15 times safer than driving in a car, and driving in a car is entirely acceptable risk. The, uh, the thermal expansion issues, the expansion joints are going to be necessary for above ground systems. At higher design speeds, the, uh, the thermal um, issues are um, significant, uh, one of the more significant challenges, uh, and is one of the reasons that drives us underground somewhere around uh, 500 to 800 miles an hour and um, where the temperature of underground is, is relatively uh, constant um, at a certain depth underground, so a lot of those uh, thermal expansion issues uh, um, go away. 
Also at the high speeds, active alignment is uh, disclosed in the patent. If you, if you go online and uh, read the first patent document, a lot of that stuff has been outlined in the, the mechanical issues have been outlined in the first patent. Um, the sealing issues, um, we uh, considered uh, that and then kind of quickly realized when we started talking with vacuum experts that uh, the amount of vacuum required for the old tube type television is about a thousand times higher quality vacuum than required for evacuated tube transport about 10 to the negative 6 tor for the TVs, about 10 to the negative 3, 10 to the negative 4 tor for evacuated tube transport is, is probably the sweet spot. That can be achieved with a single stage vacuum pump, but it'll probably be a little more efficient to use two stages. The, um, the ceiling in those, uh, those televisions will function for 20, 30 years, and they have to have about 10 to the negative 5, 10 to the negative 6 tor vacuum for that electron gun to uh, hit the phosphors. So, um, if you consider all of the vacuum tubes for, for uh, televisions put end to end, it would probably circle the world a time or two. And um, the surface area to volume ratio would be less favorable than a tube. So um, the, the tube uh, ceiling has already been demonstrated. There was a LIGO observatory that was built in Hanford and another one in Washington. And um, they're aligned in a great circle route. They're about uh, three or four miles long, each one of them. Each one of them contains 50 kilometers of welds of stainless steel. The one in Louisiana is the one that I studied. When they did the bake out and evacuated the 10 to the negative 9 tor, which is more than, it's a million times higher quality vacuum than required for evacuated tube tor um, transport, that system set idle for two years while they were installing other equipment. It's a 1.3 meter diameter tube, which is slightly smaller than optimal for evacuated tube transport. And um, they thought that their sensors were broke when they turned them back on after two years when they were getting the plant ramped up for the experiments that they were going to make there. What they discovered, that there was no measurable leaks. It still registered 10 to the negative 9 tor. There was no measurable leaks in a period of two years in that system. So ceiling technology has gotten very, very good. Um, uh, occasionally somebody shoots a hole in the Alaska pipeline and they have to go patch it. Um, those types of things might happen with evacuated tube transport. There, there will be leaks, there will be cracks, there, there are ways to uh, um, fix and repair those. All right. Um, um. There was one other issue, the uh, um, issue of breathable air for the passengers. Um, the submarine was patented over a hundred years ago, and it was experiments with the Hunley in the Civil War that uh, caused them to realize that there's only about 20 or 30 minutes of breathable air in a uh, um, evacuated tube transport uh, size of vehicle that the Hunley was, with 15 men working inside a, to turn a propeller to go try to sink the uh, ship in Savannah Bay. So. Um, they, they had worked out some of those issues even back then with uh, carbon dioxide scrubbers that are, that are proven in submarines um, where people can live months at a time underwater in those nuclear subs or months at a time um, uh, several uh, miles up in the at, um, out of the atmosphere in uh, low Earth orbit. So um, a lot of those uh, items are, are off the shelf. Uh, Navy rebreather technology is in volume serial production and the prices are coming down. So uh, um, there are a lot of significant challenges, as the professor brings up, that uh, our team of over 115 experts now in nine different countries is working on optimizing um, much, much more finer degree of detail than, than we can outline here. All right, let's, let's ask uh, Brian here. Um, have you put on a different hat? Uh, you, let's say you're in the role of a venture capitalist and Daryl comes up to you and asks you for $10 million. Um, I don't for, have it. <laughs> uh, know, knowing that you have a lot of investors breathing down your neck and, and, and that money has to be spent wisely, um, what, how would you approach this from a venture capitalist? Uh, vantage point in looking at this type of investment opportunity? Well, I'd first want to see a prototype, uh, a working prototype, even if it's only um, 
you know, a, a mile long. Um, I'd want to see, uh, I'd probably want to fly to China and check out what they're doing. I believe Korea is working on something as well. So I'd want to check that out. Um, but also, you'd have to look at, at the pro forma, the numbers showing what percentage of, of, uh, of transit, transportation of humans and transportation of, uh, of cargo this can accommodate and in what period of time. What I've seen so far from Daryl and, and from studying his website, it looks like the internal rate of return is quite, quite good. As a venture capitalist, you're hit up with uh, opportunities to invest in online startup businesses that can just scale dramatically mm -hmm. overnight. Uh, do you think this has the same scaling opportunity as an online uh, uh, e-commerce site or something like that? No, I think it's slower. Uh, the, ramp, the ramp up, um, rather than being a few years, could easily be a few decades. I just want to get clear, is the bigger impediment the government right now or venture capital? And I mean, I know this sounds kind of, like, kind of crazy, but like people go on and I give a hundred bucks to things they think are inspiring on Kickstarter all the time. So if 10% or an equivalent of 10% of the population of this country wanted to be able to say, I was there at the start and I helped fund ET3 and evacuated tube transport all over the world, and 30 million people kicked in 100 bucks. Um, that's $3 billion, if my math is right. And do you need big investors? But including that question, though, I, I want to hear, is it government or um, investors that are a bigger issue right now? Most people assume that the, that the government uh, makes paradigm changes in, in transportation and, and would be the responsible one to, uh, to do this. Our considerable research and uh, considerable uh, beating our head against the wall um, has indicated to us that uh, government really is the status quo and represents and preserves the status quo and, and has done for many, many years. And as Machiavelli observed when he wrote The Prince in the year 1513. So um, we're not really focused on uh, um, convincing government to build this. We look back and past paradigm shifts in transportation and recognize that most of them were initially resisted by government, but they took place anyway because of the um, favorable return on investment that uh, uh, making a, uh, a, a use of technology for transportation um, w w with the uh, canals in Europe, um, a major paradigm shift that was in many cases resisted by government. Um, same thing here in the United States. The uh, Teamsters uh, um, tried to keep them from uh, building the canals. The Teamsters were the ones that had the ox teams that would bring the farmer's produce to market. But the canal system allowed the farmers to bring their produce to market from twice the distance away and in less than a generation doubled the standard of living for early Americans. Um, before that, the horse doubled the standard of living for Americans. Every time you double that radius of travel, the opportunity goes up by a factor of four. The area in that circle is four times greater. So every time that we improve transportation, we double the global standard of living. Um, in the United States, we've had several, the, the, uh, the Spanish bringing the horse here, um, the canals, and then Fulton's Folly, allowing the canals to again double um, with steam power instead of muscle power. So um, that was revolutionary when, when the, uh, and initially resisted by government. It wasn't the government that did it, it was private industry for profit. And eventually the government stepped in and cleared the log jams in the Missouri River and so forth and, and uh, um, really increased the amount of usable uh, waterway, Army Corps of Engineers. Government stepped in to achieve things that private industry couldn't after the paradigm shift had occurred. Then the next paradigm shift were the invention of the railroad by Stephenson in um, the United Kingdom in the uh, 1820s. Um, that was adopted very quickly here in the United States, and there were all kinds of different entrepreneurial uh, routes that were opened up, uh, dozens of different uh, gauges. 
and eventually government stepped in, uh, resisted it at first, but then stepped in to accomplish things that uh, private industry couldn't and uh, did the land grants with uh, the ability to network everything together with one gauge standard and the transcontinental railroad with the with the golden spike and railroad literally built america and displaced muscle power steam power in a period of uh, less than 100 years displaced muscle power to niche markets and then the transition in henry ford's day um, to uh, um, a new form of uh, power, um, fossil fuel, uh, oil-powered vehicles, um, with the uh, invention of uh, Ford and and uh, Benz, um, th those uh, inventions, and, and along with the Wright brothers, again displaced they displaced trains to niche markets. In 1916 or 1910, about 90% of Americans traveled between city by train. Now it's less than 1% because the vastly superior benefit to cost ratio of automobiles and jet aircraft displaced trains to niche markets. Um, the, uh, um, I, I, I hope I've answered, I'm starting to ramble a little bit, I hope I've answered your question. The third picture up here from the end is Steve Jobs. Uh, I hope you all know who Steve Jobs is. He's the founder and now uh, chairman of the board of Apple Computers. Um, ten years ago, they were nearly bankrupt, and uh, he came out with the iPod, which in a, about a two-year period completely revolutionized and turned over the music industry. The old players in the music industry were Sony, BMG, um, Bertelsmann, and others. Uh, you don't hear those anymore. Remember the Sam Goody stores and uh, FYE and stores like that that sold music? Now you, you buy your music online. That was a total revolution in the music industry in a two-year period. Then he did the same thing with the iPhone. Apple, a company who had never produced a single telephone, within about one year completely revolutionized the, tele the mobile phone industry, smartphones. And now he's on the, the iPad, which uh, has always been a dream, but now there's, it's a billion dollar industry, multi-billion dollar industry. So Apple went from, in a 10 year period, from being nearly bankrupt to having a uh, hundred billion dollars in the bank. Uh, this is the type of sea change we need to see in transportation. And I think it's possible, but it won't be possible if it's controlled by the government. It can only be possible with private investors. I'm Drew Whitledge, and my question would be in terms of addressing some of the engineering or technical issues and some of the financial issues that have been discussed here. Do you have any, within your business plan, do you have any alternative ramping strategies that would allow you to deploy in a more conventional financial structure and a more conventional technological structure using existing proven technology that would still allow you to scale to the to the ultimate uh, concept that you're trying that you're pursuing with this yeah we definitely are focused on using off-the-shelf uh, technologies and processes and um, that's uh, definitely uh, um, part of our model also our model embraces any uh, any business model we're not asking a company as a licensee to change their business model in any way, only to broaden their focus a little bit and think outside the box a little bit and help to create a new market for their past investments that they've already made. Um, companies that have uh, invested millions of dollars in vacuum pump making capacity or um, millions of dollars in pipeline making capacity could leverage those capacities to help create a new market for their capacity that's much bigger than the present markets that they're serving, embracing traditional business models. So, um, and, and there are, we, we do have many, many uh, um, plans and scenarios. The analogy is climbing a mountain that has never been climbed before. It's pretty easy to go up a route that somebody has proven that is possible. So. If, if the mountain hasn't been climbed before, it's a little bit more difficult, and you have to have fallback uh, um, plans and, and alternate 
different uh, um, routes up that mountain. And, and we, um, as a consortium, do have uh, um, several different uh, alternative plans that, uh, um, that we're looking at. I hope that answers your question. Hi. There may be another way to demonstrate this that harnesses a very powerful force, the power of ego. And what I mean by that is that there is something very nice that happens when you have a vacuum. What happens is the um, speed of sound goes up. And there is something called the land speed record, which is primarily limited by the speed of sound, or coming through the speed of sound just a little bit further. Given the length that it takes, given the, 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 th the cost that would be involved, it would seem to me that one could build a smaller diameter tube that some, somebody who wants to go prove that they can travel faster than anybody else and beat the land speed record could actually uh, demonstrate what the capability is of this technology and might even be willing to pay for the, uh, for the trip. So, so are you saying that if he structured a competition around um, the fastest traveling human, that that might be uh, one way to attack it? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> right? And it goes, it har harnesses competitions, it harnesses all these things that have come up at other times. Um, I was going to ask Jack this question. The, um, when, when the Wright brothers made their fable flight in Kitty Hawk, and they, um, they suddenly they got off the plane and they drove over to the nearby venture capitalist firm and wanted $10 million to blow up the air, the air travel industry. Uh, can, you, can you paint a picture of the parallels between um, kind of the evolution of air travel and something like this? Well, I think about it a lot. <laughs> Aviation was my business. It's kind of interesting. They came up with this funny little machine that flew through air. They did take it to the U.S. Army that turned them down because it did not fit into their paradigm or their, they saw no use of it in warfare. They went to Europe and the French and Germans in kind of a warring continent over there, they saw a use for that thing. They eventually learned to shoot one another up and bomb people and strafe the town and kill the people. But the ultimate outcome was people could move, transportation. And so um, something else near and dear to my heart, uh, the U.S. is horrible with innovation. I just, we're horrible. Uh, when I was a cadet in Pensacola, one day Sergeant Bousquet says, everybody's going to a speech. Well, I was a cadet, so we, yes, sir. Well, it turned out to be a fortunate moment in my life. The speaker was Werner von Braun. Does everybody know who he was? I ask a lot of young people, and they don't, by the way. And after they were building the Saturn V rocket, which was five redstone rockets in a cluster, he was planning to go to the moon. And it was in 1961, May, and he spoke to us. One of the officers in the group asked him, how did it work out that when you were 22, you were the world's expert in rocketry in Germany? And he said, I wasn't. And they said, who was? And he said, Dr. Goddard of the United States of America. And he said, if he would not have solved the puzzle of controlling those rocket nozzles with gyros, gyros in the nose, they'd have never had a rocket. They ran Dr. Goddard out of, I think, Illinois. That's why he went to White Sands, New Mexico. Nobody wanted him. They ran him out of the state. We had him. Well, that's when we learned to blow up things really big. Here's another one I love. Uh, Einstein wrote his theory of relativity in 1905. E equals mc squared. Everybody knows that one. They never, never made the atomic bomb until they found out the Germans were trying to really blow up people. Well, we finally got a hold of that technology and all of that sort of stuff. We could really blow up people by huge amounts. But we did gain nuclear power knowledge 
a knowledge. We have nuclear power generating plants. So we're horrible in the United States of supporting good things like innovative changes. But why? Nobody had the use for it till we had a war. That's why it didn't fit into the U.S.'s picture. We didn't have really a war yet. But in Europe, they, it was always on the edge of war over there, that sort of thing. So I wonder if Orville and Wilbur had a 747 in mind or a Raptor that can do Mach 2. While I have the, mock, uh, the microphone, I would like to comment to Bob on uh, relative speeds. That's something I did do. Um, we would get in dogfights in planes that were doing uh, just short of Mach 2, 1,200 miles per hour. If you're going at one another, it's wild. You haven't lived until four, three flights of four planes each jumped one another all at the same time. That plane can go from zero to 1,200 miles an hour. And, but you want to know how close you can fly those? If you can control the direction of flight, how close do you think two 1,200 mile per hour planes can fly? Five foot wing overlap if you're in control of what you're doing. So it becomes a relative speed. If you're nose, nose to nose, you're talking 2,400 mile per hour closure rate. But if you're controlling, as evacuated tube will do, relative speed is the story. And you can pack a lot of capsules in that tube. That's why we can move 40 lanes of freeway in just a couple of tubes. You made a st statement earlier, uh, Daryl, about uh, uh, U.S., and I'll misquote you, so please correct the quote and then, and then give the background. But uh, you made a quote about uh, the U.S. exporting transportation like Saudi Arabia now exports oil or something. I'm wondering what you had in mind when you made that statement. The, uh, the, the, real, the real key um, to the um, quality of life that we have is transportation. It's the master key to survival. So um, every time that that advances, it, it, it advances society. And, and uh, um, half of the world's global intellectual property licensing income flows to the United States. It's the source of our wealth. The, the value of intellectual property surpassed the value of real property in this country in 1993, which is staggering to think about. So um, the, uh, um, the U.S. Uh, um, the, the, the necessity for the U.S. to, uh, to maintain our standard of living is key to maintain the um, development of, of uh, transportation technology. The uh, the world um, market in transportation is 8.65 trillion dollars per year is spent globally in transportation. The amount of money that's spent on cars in the United States is, is one of the cornerstones of our economy. If we think that the Japanese and Koreans have decimated our automobile industry by making only a 5 or 10 percent improvement in transportation technology, wait until the Chinese and the Koreans take this out of the learning institutions, the, the uh, um, universities, and start commercializing it with 10 times the transportation effectiveness of cars and aircraft. What's going to happen to our uh, automotive industries and our aircraft industries? So we think that this is really a key that uh, if, if we want to maintain our standard of living, that it is a key to develop evacuated tube transport here and become the one that set the standards and build this for the rest of the world. Every time the global standard of living increases with a major stair step, a major paradigm shift in transportation, it doubles the global standard of living. The same thing will occur with ET3. It will enable 
a 20 hour work week for the countries that develop this first for the rest and install it in the rest of the world. So, um, what I'm having trouble uh, understanding is uh, given some of the things that uh, Bert alluded to earlier in terms of the decaying of uh, uh, intellectual property over time, uh, how we continue to uh, send, uh, we continue to generate revenue for the U.S. Um, is it being, by manufacturing property? Is it by continuing to uh, become the, the only experts in the world in, uh, in this particular technology and, and expand its intellectual property? Or how, how do, we, it, it's one thing when every car has to have some of that oil that comes out of the ground over there and, and it's a hard substance, we have to keep buying it. It's another thing when everybody has to agree that your intellectual property has value and so forth. So. Yeah, well, um, that's, a, that's a very good point. And um, the, the, uh, the value of intellectual property passed up the value of real property here in the United States in 1993. It's staggering to consider that you consider the value of all the farms and all the buildings and all the, the cars and everything. The value of intellectual property has surpassed what we actually view as being wealth. And... The reason that is, is because the United States was an innovator in protecting the, the property, uh, intellectual property, and allowing a investment to be made and recovered for a, a certain period of time, a, a monopoly for a set period of time. And China has only recently recognized that that is the reason that the United States is so wealthy now. And a lot of that is trickled down from the space program. The, the, uh, um, the bold move that Kennedy made of putting a man on the moon in, in 10 years, that was an act of leadership. Most political um, people that we call leaders are not leaders, they're adept followers. But occasionally there is a, a bold act of leadership. And, and that could happen also with evacuated tube transport. So we're not discounting government that they could be involved in, in helping this happen. We spend maybe 5% um, of our time and resources in planting seeds among government. But uh, it's, it's not our main focus. Our main focus is, is private industry. So, Daryl, uh, the thing that really spurred the whole uh, space industry is is the Russians launch Sputnik. So what is the equivalent of Sputnik that gets launched that causes us to do tube travel? Yeah, well, it, it's already been launched. We just don't recognize it. I mean, okay. we, we've got the pictures, <laughs> we've got the videos. All right, um, we're gonna wrap up here. What I'd like to do is, with each of the other panelists, if you have a, a piece of advice for Daryl uh, to, to get this off the ground, what would that be? Start with Bert here. I'm going to need a minute to think about this, so I'll pass it okay. on first. Okay. I think he needs uh, a champion other than himself and all the other people involved. He needs a, a very high profile champion. Somebody like Steve Jobs, Warren Buffett, um, um, well, here in, here in Fort Collins, or just up in Fort Collins, there's a billionaire. Uh, that's not the one I was thinking of, but yeah, somebody like that who um, people listen to. So you need to latch on to somebody that's a believer and that can be the champion to get the, get the word out and start something. Okay, um, are you ready, Bert, or do yeah, I think, I think it comes back to having a, a first demonstration, and that can be on a smaller scale than the ones that you're looking at, but just something that everyone can look at that turns eyes of, oh, this worked. Because if, if, we look at, um, if we look at rail transportation, all of these things, it wasn't a single event, it was a whole series of small steps. And it is finding that small step from what already exists to the next increment that I think will make the big difference. Um, Daryl and I work close together, and uh, we need, just like Bert says, we need a mock-up so people can say this is realistic, and it's, you, you aren't a bunch of crackpots. Um, one of Daryl's comments is that 
If you're a step ahead of the crowd, you're a genius. If you're two steps ahead, you're a crackpot. And we come off being crackpots, and I think if we have a demonstrating capsule, and then the next thing is, and we already have a plan for this, put it in a tube and show that it works. Then they'll listen. Okay. Um, Brenda and Daryl have a, a book that they're going to give away tonight, and they're asking if you could uh, put your business cards in, into a basket over here for a quick drawing. And as Brenda goes, brings that around to everybody, um, why don't, uh, Daryl, why don't you say your last thoughts on what their comments here? Your business card for this, the, the, uh, the book is actually probably only half this thick. It is um, called A New Industrial Era Coming, Initial Dialogue on Evacuated Tube Transport. And it is um, their equivalent of MIT, which is uh, Singhao University, the, the uh, top uh, technical school in China, um, published this. It's the correspondence of Dr. Zhang Yoping a uh, PhD in transportation research. Um, that's him in the cover. He's signed all these books. And um, it, it's just our correspondence for the first two years with the Chinese, starting in about the year 2000 to our first trip in China in 2002. So it, it, it's the uh, um, kind of the, the foundation of the story with the Chinese. And now there's more than a dozen licensees in China. Um, and uh, most of the of the uh, things that have been built are, are there. Okay. All right, let's give these uh, panelists and Daryl a round of applause here.